everyone. Uh, my name is Gina Kim. I am the Chief Practice Officer of Cohere Health. Unfortunately, um, my partners from uh, Ortho Virginia and Humana couldn't be here due to some COVID exposures. So um, I will be uh, uh, talking about our, our case study today. So um, we're talking about transforming utilization management from an administrative burden to a quality program asset. Um, and I think Humana needs no introduction, but Ortho Virginia is an independent practice in Virginia with over um, 100 physicians um, across 32 clinics. They deliver patient-centered care in physical therapy, uh, ortho-urgent care, and outpatient surgeries. Um, and Cohere, uh, we are a digital clinical intelligence company. We are focused on um, transforming uh, the UM process into a clinical quality process. And so I think um, you've heard a lot about prior auth today, so I probably don't have to go through all of the problems um, that, and the challenges that both uh, providers and payers face, but also patients. Um, and so what we see here is uh, the burdensome process um, that everybody uh, prior to me has talked about. It creates a lot of friction for those providers, um, unnecessary time and expense spent on requirements, and a lot of frustration, especially around peer-to-peer -peer, um, reviews, which um, you know hit the uh, hit the doctors, require intense scheduling right before uh, a decision is made. Um, in addition, um, there's disconnects between the providers and payer systems, which I think a number of the innovators uh, here have talked about. Um, you know, to the data sharing between EMRs um, is challenging, and that leads to um, redundancies and inefficiencies. And ultimately, that leads to delays in patient care. So turnaround times um, that can be seven to 10 days, uh, canceled procedures because the approval wasn't given, or worst case, the procedure is actually done, and then ultimately the, the um, the, the authorization is denied. And so uh, Humana really wanted to solve this um, and brought in uh, Cohere to partner with, um, along with a number of, uh, of provider organizations. And so really, we wanted to go back to brass tacks on, on what, what is the prior authorization process about. And the reality is it's supposed to be a touch point for the payer and for the provider to align on care for that patient prior to, um, prior to the the procedure actually being done. And so really, we saw this as a really unique opportunity to build trust and actually change the conversation and the collaboration that, that is happening. And so um, we address these challenges um, by thinking more about going back to the clinical quality. So the patient care here, um, which is aligned to value, is about getting that patient onto a longitudinal care path that is appropriate for that patient, and also about being able to identify variations in care that are, are appropriate given that Patients are all different, and what's in the policy is not necessarily what's applicable to a given individual patient. And those are typically the cases that go to peer-to-peer -to -peer or cause those challenges for provider organizations. And so um, we took kind of a kind of four-step path to this. So the first is to think about the care path. So um, instead of thinking about individual transactions, thinking about the care path that a patient is actually going on, that journey that that patient goes on, and could we actually align with leading provider um, medical societies? Um, so in this case, um, starting in musculoskeletal care, um, aligning with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons with their evidence-based practice, with their evidence-based guidelines, and aligning that to a care path. So to consider that patient's entire journey, not just individual, um, individual procedures. And so um, based on that, we also built out a user experience, um, and this is an area that we are eager to partner with on with uh, you know, any innovators who are, who are sharing data, um, but really that can decrease the, the burden of pulling that data from the EMR into, um, into the format that it needs to be looked at across a care path. Then we layer in influence without denials. And so um, this is a concept which actually there was a question on, how do you, how do you influence that pro provider before, um, and have that provider actually be presented with the information that enables them to make a better decision about that patient before the authorization is even submitted? And so actually aligning that, that and letting them know in a really transparent way, what are the ways that, um, you know, whether it's site of service or whether it's that service itself, that conservative therapy really should be considered prior to, um, prior to a, a, a surgery. What are the ways that you can actually get that information at scale out to providers? And then finally, um, this is all built on a robust analytics platform um, where we consider and are looking at cohorts of patients, um, you know, practice patterns of providers in order to identify that variation. 
And so the results of this approach have been um, really that, you know, it's a um, win across the board for Ortho Virginia and providers, health plans um, such as Humana, as well as Humana members and patients. So in terms of Ortho Virginia and other providers, they're seeing much lower denial rates, um, also significantly less time spent on prior auth and frustration, and the, um, the solution has a 92% uh, provider satisfaction rate. Um, Humana is seeing 40 to 50% reduced administrative burden, as well as um, despite the fact that we're creating such a provider-friendly process that is really rooted in the evidence and the patient care journey, um, they're also still seeing incremental medical savings due to the fact that we're able to nudge and get the you know get that patient onto the right um, the right path without that irrational variation. And then finally, for Humana members and patients, they're getting faster access to care. In other words, they're being scheduled sooner because we can offer that instant approval. Um, and then also lower complication rates um, and uh, seeing care in appropriate sites. And so we're really proud of this last one. I think, again, um, if I think about lessons learned here, it's really to think about the purpose of the process. And at the end of the day, that purpose for all of us, I think, here is the patient and what that patient's journey is. And then based on that, the process follows and the technology. And so I think if we can keep that in mind, um, you know, it, it, it will benefit all of us over, uh, you know, and, and, our, and our patients that we serve. So any questions? I think the question was, what's the most difficult challenge in, in building, uh, building this great solution? Um, I, I honestly think the, the most difficult challenge is getting people to the table um, to, to think about the, um, to think about the, the actual um, appropriate care, patient care path. And so that's one of the things, the reason that we didn't want to build that ourselves, right? We wanted to go to um, you know, the appropriate authorities such as the AOS who have that. We are also using data to supplement that, um, by the way. So a lot of our data and analytics is based on, okay, that's you know, people in a room coming up with a care path that's based on literature. Can we back that up by actually looking at the data and the way that patients are flowing through? And we can see, who's actually um, changing providers, who's going through you know, multiple periods where they're getting injections um, one after the other and the interval isn't correct. And so we're really trying to marry the clinical evidence with the actual on the ground patient journeys that, that we're seeing. Yeah, so these outcomes are actually, um, are, we have an EMR solution um, where we partner. We also have a, 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 an app, a portal. And so these, these results are actually based on the overall. And so one of the reasons we did that is because, um, you know, even though health systems have a lot of the volume for a given geography, you're going to have all these independent practices like the Ortho Virginias, you know, like the Ortho Carolinas, which they don't have the time, the capacity to do an EMR integration un unless they're on a cloud-based platform like Athena or, or the others. And so for us, it was really important to have a solution that scales, think about that whole 100% of providers that you need to reach, and really try to, you know, again, because it's about the clinical journey, they already have a process in place. Over time, I have no doubt this is going to shift, but it's a great place to start. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, did Humana replace uh, Humana, or sorry, uh, Milliman or Interqual or some of the, you know, kind of national, national content vendors? Um, so it's actually a complicated, a slightly complicated question. Um, the reality is uh, a lot of the um, NCDs and LCDs are public, and so those, for example, are set by the, um, by the government. Then you have um, the commercial plans, and so those are those policies are set by you know that that line of business, and so between that you're getting most of the policy guidance, and then anything else we can fill in. Um, but yes, in in a way, um, there's also a distinction between what you deny on versus what you nudge and approve on, and so that's that's where the AOS comes in is. That's, they're actually ahead of a lot of the policies in terms of the evidence space. And so that's what we're using because that's what providers understand. They, they know the literature out there. And so that little nudge helps to get them to the right care. So, yes. Um, you can come, we, I would be happy to talk to you about how we can partner on that, absolutely, yeah. 
uh, sorry, the question was, does Humana have an open standard? And yeah, happy to chat about that. Okay, I know I'm over here, so any other thoughts? All right, who's next? Thank you.